Ora, good evening. The world's biggest dairy exporter, Fonterra, has trimmed its 2014 milk payout by 2.9% to a forecast payout of $8.40 per kilogram of milk solids, but it still remains a record payout. Fonterra announced the Farmgate milk price will fall further next season with an expected payout of $7 per kilogram of milk solids in 2015, a 17% cut. Dairy product prices have dropped 23% since Fonterra's board forecast a record milk payout in February, but since then prices fell to a new 15-month low in the latest global dairy trade auction last week, reflecting milk supply is currently too high for the international market to absorb. The City Council has spent in excess of $100,000 in a bid to host the Auckland to Bluff yacht race. Now, two City Councillors are asking where the money has been spent. At last night's City Council meeting, Councillors Kett and Arnold were promised a report into race expenditure by Ch Council Chief Executive Richard King. Councillor Arnold spoke to Hunter Andrews earlier. The Council really should have done due diligence. So I've asked um, Chief Executive Richard King for um, a total report, not just on where the money went to, but how the actual um, whole thing came about. Was there a cost-benefit risk analysis report done? Was due diligence done on the, um, the promoters of this yacht race? I would uh, um, doubt very much not. How much money's been spent, and not just gone to the A to B yacht race organisers, but how much council money's been spent by the likes of the Mayor and the Chief Executive travelling around to Auckland trying to drum up um, more support? Um, where's it been spent? How's it been spent? And, um, and, and what's the outcome? Is it just money that's gone? It sounds like Richard King has granted you access to documents. You want a report? I've asked for a report and um, he told me quite flippantly last night, well there's information there, you're welcome to look at it, but um, that's not my job. Um, the Chief Executive is responsible to the Council um, to provide us with information that we can um, make decisions on and at the end of the day um, I want to know, and so do many people, how this whole debacle um, eventuated and what is the result. You and Councillor Kidd are looking for a money trail in effect. How long are you giving Richard King to produce one? Poor old uh, Councillor Peter Kidd, um, by his reckoning, has been asking since December for a report um, and it hasn't been forthcoming. I sent an email to Richard King um, a couple of weeks ago outlining what I'd like to know on behalf of the people. Um, I got no response. So it was only last night when Peter Kett raised it as urgent business at a council meeting that it was brought forward. I raised my points and at, at the conclusion of that, Mr King assured us there would be a report by next week. And so you'll expect it next week and if it's not the desired report, what then? Well, this could be a matter for the Auditor General's Office because basically there's a legal process to follow and um, we have to be sure as elected officials, as elected councillors, that the information and the processes are robust for ourselves because there's no point making um, decisions to spend money um, that's not ours um, on, on campaigns that really, if you look even slightly into them um, and are obviously um, no-goers. Dog owners in the South City Q area are being asked to ensure their dogs are confined at night following a series of dog attacks on sheep in recent weeks. Invercargill City Council received a report on May 16th that a stock owner had lost 37 ewes mauled by wandering dogs. The stock owner was supplied with Council's large dog cage, which allows a dog to be humanely caught. But despite this, the extensive night patrol and extensive night patrolling by animal services staff, there have been no sightings or captures of wandering dogs. This week, the stock owner has again been in contact with Council to say more stock have been killed by dogs in overnight attacks. Council wants dog owners to be aware dogs running amongst or attacking stock can be destroyed by the stock owner and also want to hear from anyone who may have information. The annual Rotary Book Sale is almost underway and organisers say book numbers are up on last year and the quality of books is better too. Whether it's crime, history or page-turning romantic novels, you'll find it all this weekend at the Invercargill Rotary Club's annual book sale, where generously donated books are providing a community service by making it affordable to read, while also raising money for charities. 
people know the events on. People will actually buy books here this weekend and they'll actually bring them back next year. So people actually do hold on to their books for, for the event. And we actually do, do a lot of pack-ups from homes. So yeah, it works out pretty well. It's estimated there's between 20 and 30,000 books this year, plus hundreds of other items like LPs, board games, DVDs and magazines. Based on feedback from last year's event, organisers want to make it even cheaper to read and decided on a price review. Yeah, we have actually reduced our prices a little bit this year uh, as opposed to last year, back to where they used to be. So I'm sure that the um, public will, will be satisfied with their purchases. There are always some leftovers and there's a plan for the books that don't sell too. Well actually they go to Southern Enterprises and they, and they recycle them there into pulp. And you try and keep any quality books over for next year's sale Absolutely. or do they just all go? Well some, some quality books will, will remain because we do have special specials here so we will hang on to those. The Collectibles Corner is back this year in the theatre foyer where plenty of quality publications can be found. Price points are a little more expensive to both respect the value of the donations and potential online prices. The club are hoping to turn over $60,000 this year, leaving them with a $45,000 profit which will then be donated to worthy causes. Organisations are able to apply to our uh, directors uh, in the club um, for, with funding proposals and they can download uh, those forms from our website. Um, and the usual process is, is that that comes to our directors meetings once a month and we approve funding on that, on that basis. Recipients of last year's proceeds include the Bluff Coast Guard and there's a nice synergy between the book sale profits and literacy donations. We've also um, given money to the Invercargill City um, Library's uh, summer reading program. We've also combined with uh, Invercargill East uh, Rotary Club with the literacy packs that we've given out around the, the Invercargill schools um, for the new entrance as well. Some funds were also donated to international projects like shelter box and disaster relief. The event now runs over three days with some bargain deals on the final day. We are from Thursday evening 5pm through to Sunday afternoon at 3pm. Uh, 3 so it's, uh, it's quite a lot of time for people to come in and look for box, so we really we like their support. Organisers say the back-breaking work is made easier at the Civic Theatre and expect the stage will be packed with people diligently searching for their literary treasure. Margo Sutherland, South Today News. Stay with us still to come. Board changes at the Community Trust of Southland and concerns about food provision at Southland Hospital. Welcome back. Community Trust of Southland Chair Tracy Hicks has today announced the appointment of accountant Ross Jackson as a new trustee. Mr Hicks has welcomed Mr Jackson's appointment, noting he'd bring an excellent blend of skills and experience to the trust, including substantial business and governance experience. The appointment was made after trustee Trish Lindsay stepped down after two four-year terms on the trust board. Trustee appointments are made by the Finance Minister after recommendations by the trust, other organisations and individuals within South Southland. A move by the Southern District Health Board to consider having hospital food prepared at, in a centralised location, possibly Christchurch, has raised concerns with hospital kitchen workers that their jobs may be under threat. Crown owned Health Benefits Limited is charged with finding savings in the health sector and food preparation options are currently being explored. Southern DHB kitchen workers had their request to address the board at the last, at the last meeting in Invercargill rejected. Instead, they held a silent protest. Last night, the Service and Food Workers Union held a public meeting to air workers' uncertainties. Hunter Andrews went along and spoke to some of those concerned. Yeah, I think the key problem is the lack of communication of where, they're at, where they are at with the business case. Um, there seems to be a conflicting information from the DHB and HBO as to where we're at. And of course that really affects our members, of just not knowing, not knowing from day to day if there's going to be a decision made. HBL have said, well certainly representative said to me that if the option was preferred, if it was proven to be the best option that it would be, the food would be supplied here in South and they would go with that. Does, does that not satisfy you in some way that they are exploring all the options? So you're saying that HBL did say that if we had a really good service down here they would continue with it? Well they it. said if that was the preferred option, if, yeah. they, if it worked out that the model down here was the right one, they would continue with it. Well, I don't know if that's in line with the feedback that we've had, but I mean that would be absolutely fantastic. And I think one aspect of looking at it actually is that if we're not, maybe we should ask why. We've got some pretty loyal staff, and once you break that staff loyalty then things are not good. 
and I've seen this happen in my 40 years in the hospital service. I've seen it happen more lately than after this DHB model. But the, the staff morale goes down, and I just simply can't see where the savings are in contracting out because the contractor is there to make a bond. They're not there for fun, and so that money is going out to the shareholders, whereas in my view it could be done probably just as cheaply in-house. And I guess the thought that they weren't allowed to address that DHB board meeting, they're hoping to address the one in Dunedin on the 5th, does that present issues? They are yes, elected it's representatives. It's a breach of democracy. In my opinion. You see, the, these members we elect are not really elected. They do what they're told. The chairman is appointed by the government and the minister tells him what to do, or who, she, whatever. The, 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 we haven't got any proper representation from the public into the, into the DHBs. They're really a quasi-government department. So you would urge the DHB, the board, to let, let the union and the workers Absolutely. speak? Absolutely. Yes, we sh they should know the concerns of people. And were you surprised, firstly, that they weren't listened to? They had to have a silent protest at, at the last meeting? Yeah, I was very surprised at that. Certainly my experience of being on the Southern District Health Board would have been that we would have allowed time for a deputation from the most, some of the most affected people to give their to give their feelings and their experiences and their concerns about what was happening. And at this stage to say that there was commercial sensitivity seems to me a nonsense argument because they don't seem to have made a decision about even that contracting out will happen, let alone being in the territory of discussing the nitty gritty of money. So to not have heard from people who will be very affected and who are feeling a high level of uncertainty to me is just nonsense. The board should have been listening to the public. That's what the public and public health actually means. Listen to people. And South and DHB members were invited to last night's meeting but all opted not to attend. More Kiwis are studying at degree or postgraduate level with an 8% increase over the past decade. Ten years ago, 48% of New Zealanders studied at tertiary level while last year this increased to 56%. A tertiary education enrolments report for 2013 shows continued growth in enrolments and higher qualifications by younger students, but a fall for older students as employment prospects improved. Last year, 418,000 students enrolled in formal study programs, which is in part due to improved NCEA performance and the push to have more young people achieve level four or higher on the New Zealand qualifications framework. And that's it from us next on Sport Tonight, an exclusive interview with Southland Sharks coach Paul Henare from the news team. Good night.